Hello, and welcome to my tutorial series on Crusader Kings 2. I'm your host, Imperialis, and like I said, this is my attempt at doing a tutorial for this game. Uh, there's some really good tutorials out there on YouTube already. In fact, I learned how to play uh, CK2 based on a tutorial, tutorial series done by a fellow who ran a channel called Text Tavern. But I wanted to do my own. Partially because a lot of the tutorials that you see are quite dated now. The game's been out since 2012, and in that time, they've made some pretty major updates to the game, changing some of the mechanics and things like that, like, and some fairly fundamental stuff um, that the older videos just it didn't exist. Um, I also wanted to do a tutorial series because most of the ones out there kind of show you the mechanics and give you an idea of how the game plays, but they don't really tell you much in the way of suggestions for how to play the game. And I wanted to take a crack at giving you some strategies that might help you get your feet off the ground and make for a more enjoyable experience for you. Now. What is Crusader Kings 2? Crusader Kings 2 is a grand strategy game published by Paradox and developed by Paradox. Uh, and probably their most popular game ever, their best selling game that they've ever produced. Because they've been doing these sorts of games for a long time. The grand strategy is sort of their thing. And earlier on, they were incredibly complex, very difficult to figure out the mechanics for them, and kind of a beast to actually learn how to play. Crusader Kings was the first game that actually had an approachable user interface, gave you the information that you needed to play in an easily accessible manner, and it was generally just a lot more fun to play. Still a very complex game, but definitely more approachable than some of their previous titles. So, to get started, you could do the tutorials. Um, they're not the greatest in the world. Paradox had improved their overall gameplay significantly for Crusader Kings 2, but they still hadn't figured out how to make a decent tutorial, so you could probably just skip over them and jump right in. So, when you go to start a game, the first thing you're going to have to do is pick who you want to be. And without any DLC, you can be any Christian nobleman between the years 1066 and 1337 in the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War. The game actually goes to about 1453, I believe. Um, <coughs> it's sometime in the middle of the 15th century, either way. And you can play as any Christian ruler. Um, with the exception of if you don't have the DLC, you can't play as like the Doge of Venice because you need the Republic DLC to play that. And the Papacy has always kind of been closed off. You can't play as the Pope. Other than that, though, the world is kind of your oyster. You could go for a very high level game and play as Kaiser Heinrich III of the Holy Roman Empire and control the entirety of the Holy Roman Empire. You could play as. Uh, Constantinos, Balius Constantinos the Tenth of the Byzantine Empire, and control a massive amount of territory, have a ton of power, be a major force within the continent. Uh, alternatively, you can step down from that and play one of the kings. You could play as the King of France, King Philippe. Um, you could play as King Harold the Second, King Harold Godwin of England. Um, all sorts of different kings that you could be. You could take it down a step further, play as a duke, and some of the dukes are independent rulers in their own right, like the Duke of Apulia here, Duke Robert, doesn't he's independent, he's top dog in his patch of land, doesn't owe fealty to anybody, or you could play potentially as the, the Duke of Aquitaine, and uh, owe fealty to the King of France, um, and then below that, 
uh, the small fish of sort of the feudal nobility are the counts, the counts and earls. And these are the little guys. They typically only control one, maybe two provinces or counties, as they're called in the game. Uh, and most of them will owe fealty to a duke and in turn owe fealty, who in turn owes fealty to a king. So this fellow here uh, would owe fealty to the Duke of Aquitaine, who owes fealty to King Philippe, and so on. Um, some of them are independent, and that's actually what we're going to be playing. We are going to be an independent count over here in Ireland. Now, I picked a count because even though they don't have a ton of power, they are much more manageable, especially for a first game. You don't have as much stuff to worry about. You don't need to worry about vassals and keeping them happy. You can just kind of focus on your family and your initial expansion and grow with the game. And your understanding of the game will grow as your, your domain does. So we're going to be playing as the Duke of Dublin. Earl, well, not the Duke, the Count of Dublin or the Earl of Dublin. Earl Murcad of Dublin. And I picked him quite deliberately because Ireland is a little bit isolated from the rest of Europe. Uh, the only major threat is England. And with this being set in 1066, which if you know anything about English history is when there was a three-way war going on between the King of England, Harold Godwinson, King Hadrada of Norway, Harold Hadrada of Norway, and, probably most famously, uh, Duke, at this point, William the Bastard of Normandy, who ends up becoming King William the Conqueror of England. And so generally speaking, England spends about a hundred years or so just as a mess. There'll be rebellions and all sorts of stuff like that that keeps England from being a major threat. The other nice thing about Ireland is there is no king, and there's only two dukes. There's the Duke of Connacht, who only controls a single county himself, and the they call him King Murcad, but he's actually a duke. He's a petty king of Munster, who only controls two counties. So with that in mind, we'll be jumping in as Dublin here. And we will start playing. There's another reason I specifically picked Dublin. Playing once we get in. Wait for it to load in. And when you first start playing, this is the screen that you will be confronted with. And you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, what the heck is going on? I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. Which is understandable. There's a lot to see here. So we'll start out, we'll take a look at us. Because right now, at least, we are the Earl Mercat of Dublin. And he is, he doesn't have a liege, he's the ruler of this tiny little patch of land here. But he's top dog. There's no higher authority. So, we can take a look at his portrait here. We can see we have a fan fantastic mustache. The picture is actually from a DLC, the Celtic Portraits Pack. I left them enabled um, because they don't actually affect the game, and this way you can see what they look like. Decide if you like the DLC, those particular DLCs or not. And I will do another episode specifically on the different DLCs and what you might want to consider uh, if you wanted to pick some up. But I picked him very deliberately because if we look here, his dad is the Earl of Leinster, and I am his heir. So when dad dies, I inherit that county, and then I'll have two counties to my name, which is a much stronger starting position than having a single one, as you might expect. But let's actually look at the character card here. So, looked at his portrait, there's his wife, we can see he's married. His son and heir is... he's wearing the... the... oh, I can't remember the name of it, the 
the hat that a bishop would wear, because he is my court chaplain, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but this is what you're going to see. And we can see we're 41 years old, and right beside that there's actually a little Wikipedia link, so he is evidently an actual person. He's a real person, and you could go and check out all about him on Wikipedia, should you feel so inclined. You can see that we're Irish, we're Catholic, and it also tells us where we're ruling from. And then we've got our stats here. There's five different attributes that every character has. The top one is diplomacy, which affects how other people perceive you. It'll affect your relationships with other people and that sort of stuff. Martial is what affects your ability to command troops. Uh, it affects combat and that sort of thing. Stewardship affects the taxes you collect and also the size of your domain, the maximum size of your domain, or the number of counties that you personally control, but again, we'll get into that later. Intrigue affects how successful you're going to be at doing sneaky, underhanded, plotty type things like assassinations and things like that. And then learning affects how well you, how good you are at progressing technologically. So we can see we've got fairly mediocre stats overall. Eight is kind of the average, and we're significantly below that with those two, and a little bit below that with the others. To the right here, you see our state values. Because he's a ruler, he has some support. So for state diplomacy, the way that that gets calculated is you get, or for any of the state values, is they add half of your wife's score and adds the full score from your counselor. So in this case, because Earl Mercad has six, his wife gives him a bonus of one, and his counselor gives him a bonus of 14. His state diplomacy is actually 21. And it's the same with all the others. Over here, uh, first you see your money, your personal wealth. So we have 43.8 gold, and each month we gain 1.93, which isn't very much. We're, we're not exactly rolling in dough here. Uh, you use money to build new buildings and your holdings and stuff like that and recruit mercenaries and all that sort of stuff. And to give you an idea of the cost, a mercenary company is usually going to cost about a hundred gold. So you can see how big of an investment that would be for Earl Mercad here. Uh, prestige is basically what the other nobles think of you. It, um, if you have a high prestige, it will make them like you more. And it also affects your score, along with piety, and I'll explain how it does that after I explain piety. Because piety is almost the exact same as prestige, except it affects what religious figures think of you. So what the Pope thinks of you, what your bishops think of you, things like that. Now, anytime your ruler dies, because you're not playing as a country per se, you're playing as a dynasty uh, or a family. Anytime your ruler dies and your heir takes over, his prestige and piety gets added to your overall score. And so if Earl Mercad were to fall off his horse tomorrow and crack his head open on a rock, then he would get a total of 30 added to my overall score, which isn't very much. Um, we'll get that up, though. Not a problem. And then the last one here is just your score. Now to arrive at these stats, you're looking at these down here. These are just different vices, virtues, personality traits, things like that, that affect your overall stats. The first one here is education, and anything that looks like a little book like that is an education stat. So depending on who educated him and how good they were at it, you'll gain an education trait in one of the five categories, that'll give you bonuses depending on how good it is. There's four or five different ranks to it. So Misguided Warrior is the lowest martial trait. 
The misguided warrior was trained in warfare and the martial arts, but sadly lacks all talent for it. So it gives him one additional martial, lowers his learning by one, and increases his health by a little bit. The rest of these traits are more personality traits. So he's lustful, increases his chance of having kids, but makes the church like him a little bit less. Honest, which lowers his intrigue, increases his diplomacy, and improves his relationship with other honest people and lowers his reputation with, or lowers how much dishonest people like him. Humble, same sort of deal. It increases his piety and affects people's opinions of him. And temperate, which increases his stewardship, makes the church like him a little bit more. And again, in, improves or decreases opinions with people depending on what their traits are. So that's what the character card looks like. At the lower half here, you can see the family, and we'll get more into what all these tabs do sort of as they come up in the game. Uh, we can see his titles. He only has one. He is the Earl of the County of Dublin, but that's it. And that's about all there is in this screen. Again, well, there is a lot more in that screen, but we'll get into it as it becomes relevant. So, now we're sitting here staring at it. We still have time paused. We haven't actually started even playing yet. But before we do anything else, there's always two things that you need to do before you start playing. The first is to assign your counselors. So to do that, you click on your council button here and it brings up the different people who sit on your council. And you've got five counselors, one corresponding to each attribute. You can change who your counselors are by clicking on the appoint button. Generally speaking, you want the person with the highest stats. Um, and at the beginning of the game, it's going to kind of automatically pick those guys for you. So, with this, each counselor has different things that they can do. Your chancellor can improve diplomatic relations, which kind of explains itself. You send them off to do diplomatic things with other rulers and make them like you more. Fabricate claims, which is what you do to basically get a reason to go to war with somebody and take over their territory. Or one of the ways you can get a reason to go to war with somebody and take over their territory. And so dissent, which, if you're being a bit more aggressive, you could send him out to try and muck up relationships between a nobleman and his liege. So I could conceivably send him over to York to so dissent and whisper in the Duke of York's ear that, hey, you know, you really should rebel against your king and cause some problems that way. Your marshal can suppress revolts, which is useful when you're sort of conquering new territories, uh, especially if they're of a different culture or a different religion than you, because they're likely to rebel. Train troops, which will increase your levy size, and we'll get more into the military and how that works in a later episode. Research military technology, which will just provide a boost to your overall technological development in the military end of things. Your steward can collect taxes, just give you a straight up cash boost. Oversee construction, which you use when you're building new buildings in your counties, and again that's something that will cross that bridge when we come to it. And research economic tech, so just like the research military tech, except for economy. Your spy master can scheme, so I could send t set him to scheme in my home province here, and he'd keep his ears peeled for anybody who has grievances against me who might, might want to assassinate me or something like that. Uh, build a spy network, and you'd want to use this more aggressively. You could use this against a target that you... Uh, want to potentially assassinate or do something else underhanded with and study technology so I could send him off to a foreign country that has better technology than me and he'd try to figure out how they're doing what they're doing and that sort of stuff and then your court chaplain can 
prost proselytize, which so convert the locals. Works well if you're, again, if you've conquered somebody who isn't the same religion as you, you can try and get them all converted over to Catholicism. Research cultural tech, which works the same way as the other researches. And then improve religious relations, which works much like improve diplomatic relations, but it's aimed more towards religious figures, so bishops or the pope and things like that. So we need to assign these guys. And I'm going to want, at the beginning of the game, you're usually pretty safe just to research military tech, research economic tech, and research cultural tech. I'm going to leave these two unassigned for now because I'm going to be wanting to fabricate a claim and probably build a spy network or potentially ski. Um, but I want to be able to pick out a target first and I need to give it about a month before I decide who exactly my first target is going to be for my claim fabrication. So we'll leave them as is for now. The next thing you want to do is start setting up marriages and this is probably one of the most important aspects of the game is managing marriages and managing your family and stuff like that you can see i'm already married so that's not a concern but my heir is not and in spite of the religious get up he's not actually a bishop so he can get married if he were a bishop, I wouldn't be able to, but he's not. He's just my court chaplain. Largely because his learning skill is the best that I got. But anyhow, I want to marry him. Or get him married. I don't I don't want to marry him, but I want to find him a wife. And with your heir and anybody who's in your family like this, one of the best things you can do is start hunting around for alliances. Because if you marry somebody from another noble family, that will form an alliance with them. It's the only way to form alliances in the game, actually, is through marriage. So, I've already done some poking around, and I've got a pretty good idea of who I want to marry, but I'll explain my thought process to you. I'm going to be going to war on Ireland here, so I want somebody who's close by who'd actually have a chance of contributing troops. Like, I could conceivably try and marry him into the Holy Roman Empire or something like that, but there's no way he's going to get involved in some petty dispute over in Ireland. So I want to pick somebody a bit closer to home. One option would be somebody like one of the English Dukes. Uh, he doesn't have any kids. He doesn't have any kids. But if you poke around here long enough, eventually you'll find somebody with a daughter that you could potentially marry to. Um, England, though, tying yourself too close to that horse, especially with a 1066 start, can be a little dangerous. They'll draw you into some big, ugly wars. So I decided on the petty king Blenid of Gwynedd. Bledin of Gwynedd. He has one, two, three daughters. And they're all viable choices, and at this point it kind of comes down to who has better stats. So we'll take a look at her first. She's the oldest daughter. She's 24 years old. So she is a few years older than my son. My son is 19. And the other down... Oh, no, he doesn't. Sorry, my first sort of experimental playthrough, he had a trait that was kind of bad for an heir to have called Chaste, that lowers his chance of having kids. But if you look at his stats, he's kind of average, a little bit better than me, actually. Um, and he's zealous, or zealous, uh, cruel, trusting, and humble. So I want to find a good match for him. And looking at his daughters, she's not bad. She has a high intrigue score. But other than that, she's kind of eh. A little average. Better than average, but take a look at the others. Now she has a high diplomacy score. She's gregarious, but ah, here's that trait. Chaste. So chaste actually lowers your fertility. It makes it less likely for you to have kids. Which is 
never a good thing because to lose the game, uh, all it takes is for you to die without an heir. And, I mean, chances are they'd have at least one kid, but it might be a daughter. It, it, Chased is just, it can be, it can be a game killer, potentially. So, a good trait to avoid. And third daughter here is actually quite good. She has a very high learning skill. She's kind, shy, content, and arbitrary. She has a very high um, education skill, though. This mastermind theologian is very, very good. Um, it does, however, as you see, lower her fertility. So I'm thinking I might actually go with this one. She has a high intrigue, which is something I kind of lack in my court. I think he only has an intrigue of one or two, and my son isn't much better. So we'll see if we can if he's not interested in potentially marrying her. So to do that, you go into diplomacy with her, click on arrange marriage. She's already selected. I click here, and then I click on my son. So, propose that Domno and Gwenlin get married. As a relative of an earl, Domno will gain two prestige from marrying into House Mathrafel, and a hundred from marrying the relative of a king. So he'd gain prestige from this marriage, because he's marrying... she's a princess. Now, this is a box that you almost never want to click. Matrilineal. Basically, what that would mean is instead of joining her joining my family, he would join her family. The only time you want to do that is if you're marrying off a daughter who's your heir or something like that. Um, but very, very rarely do you want to try and make a matrilineal marriage. Now, this little flag here means that it would result in an alliance. So by marrying her, dad will become my ally, which is a very, very good thing, because compared to a lot of the other counts on Ireland, he's quite powerful. So, we'll send that off. And now, if we look here, just going to go in here, and um, I've got a couple more people I can marry. Now, they're courtiers, though. They're just sort of dudes in my court who aren't members of my family. They're very minor noblemen. And so he wouldn't be interested in marrying one of his daughters off to them. And I'm not going to be able to secure any alliances by marrying them. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start trying to find what are called super wives. To do that, you go into the Find Characters button here. It's in the lower right. Click on that. And this is a tool that you can use to find anyone in the game. You can filter it different ways and all sorts of stuff like that. Like search vassals and search court become more useful when you uh, uh, have a big empire to try and manage. But for now, because we're looking for a wife, we want to search all. We want to pull up everybody. And because we're looking for wives, we want them to be women. And we don't want them to be married already. So now it's cut the, well, it's still a massive long list, as you can see. Now, I can't marry, like, not all these are potential wives. Some of them, like, if I were to, say, look at her, I wouldn't be able to marry her because she's too far away. I go into diplomacy, don't even have the option of arranging marriage. She's from way off over in Eastern Europe somewhere. I'm going to make it, no, let's find out. Yeah, she's way over here on the far side of the map. So, I mean, in Ireland, they probably don't even know that this place exists, never mind be a viable place to find a wife from. So we want to find someone a little closer, and the easiest way to do that is just go My Religion. That's going to just pull up the, the Catholics fairly close by, definitely people that I should be able to arrange a marriage with. And now what I'm going to do is, I'm not actually going to ask to marry her, but I'm going to take a look and see who I have to marry off. So I've got my Chancellor, 
and my spy master both need wives. So I'm going to be looking for somebody with a high diplomacy skill and a high intrigue skill. So to do that, you can sort this list by clicking on the different things. So I'm going to sort it by diplomacy, and that's going to bring the people with the highest diplomacy up to the top. Now when you're looking at super wives, you want to be looking at their stat lines. You want wives with high stats overall, and particularly you want to be looking for wives with good hereditary traits. Now what do I mean by that? We've already talked about the personality traits a little bit here. We've already talked about the education traits. This is a genetic trait. So she, anything that's in a little heart shape like that is a genetic trait. So she is quick. So she's a bit smarter than the average bear, is basically what that means. It increases all of her stats, and the nice thing about genetic traits is they can be passed down from father to son, or mother to son, or daughter, or whatever the case may be. That was my timer, so I should probably hurry up with this. And there's also, as you can see here, negative genetic traits. So Ustanich here is a club foot. And those can be passed down as well. Now that's a fairly minor one. It just lowers your marshal by one and lowers the attraction of opposite sex, the opposite sex to you. But there can be some really, really bad ones like slow or stupid. Uh, inbred is another potential one if you marry in your family tree too much. Uh, but those ones you want to try and avoid because they can be passed on generation to generation as well. So overall though, she looks like a pretty awesome candidate. She is fairly close by. She's... Now my one concern is, judging by that, is it looks like she might be in a Muslim court. But we'll see if we can't potentially marry her anyhow. So we'll arrange a marriage between her and my Chancellor. And he says yes. Even though her ruler is a Muslim, he's okay with her. She's from the Iberian Peninsula somewhere down here, which is why she's Catholic, but her ruler is Muslim. Um, but same deal, you don't want to click the matrilineal. There's going to be no prestige gain or loss or anything like that here, because it's two courtiers marrying each other. And with that, we'll just click send, and we'll go and marry her. Now, next one I want to marry is a someone with a high intrigue. And so I sorted by intrigue, and right at the top here I can already see there's a fantastic one. She has another hereditary trait called genius. And genius is sort of like how the other one was swift. Genius is swift on steroids. It increases all of your stats by five, which is brilliant. And overall the rest of her stats look pretty good too, with an intrigue of 25... Her stewardship isn't the greatest, but that's okay. So yeah, we'll see if we can't get her married as well. So again, go into her, arrange the marriage with him. And he'll say yes as well, because again, it's courtier marrying another courtier. It doesn't really care all that much. And we'll send it. So that's the early game setup. Uh, that's all you really need to worry about doing before you start playing. And I'm going to put a cut in here, and next session we'll actually start the game up and start making some of our early moves. And yeah, um, so for those of you who are interested in the free copy of Crusader Kings 2, it's just going to be a pretty straightforward contest. As you can probably tell, I'm a pretty new YouTube channel here, so getting a few more people watching the video and commenting on it and stuff like that is always a good thing. So all I'm asking you to do is subscribe and then add a comment saying what, what you are most interested in trying out in Crusader Kings 2. 
Uh, it could be a particular ruler you're interested in playing. It could be a particular country. It could be just something you want to do. Um, and it can be pretty general, because, I mean, I'm not expecting you to know the ins and outs of, I want to play some minor count in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire and know exactly who it's going to be, because uh, you haven't played the game. Uh, only other request would be, if you already own Crusader Kings 2, please don't uh, apply for it. Just, I don't know, give somebody who doesn't have the game yet a chance to play it. But, I mean, that's kind of the honor system. I can't tell who owns the game or not. So, with that, I'm going to call this to a close. Oh, and the contest is going to run uh, for 10 days. So, it's August 11th today. And um, I'll be running a contest until August 21st. Um, and then at that point, I'm going to do the highly technical method of putting everybody's name in a hat and pulling one out at random. And I'll just message you on YouTube or something like that. And we'll, I'll figure out how to get you your CD key. Um, it is just a CD key. It's not like I have to gift it to you on Steam or anything like that. So, yeah. I'm going to cut the video here, and we will see you in the next episode. Cheers.